we need to talk about the C word. Actually, we need to talk about three C words. Our first C word is shh, say it quietly now, conspiracy. Now, I know we don't like the word, but you must, I mean must watch to the end of this video and you'll see exactly why it's justified. You see, there's a big secret being guarded very closely by a lot of mainstream historians today. And it's that the ancient world was unimaginably different to our world as it is today. So different that if you travelled back in time using one of these, a time machine, you'd actually be stunned by how many countries were once dominated by black people. Like a region of the world known to the ancients as Colchis. And this is our second C. C for Colchis, or more specifically, Colchians. Here's what Herodotus, the famed father of history, had to say about these mysterious people. Quote, As for me, I judge the Colchians to be a colony of Egyptians, because like them, they are black with woolly hair. End quote. This one statement, enshrined forever in the annals of history, has been the source of the world's longest lasting aneurysm. Oh, all those sleepless nights the debunkers of Afrocentrist content makers endured. One minute they loved men like Herodotus for proving the intellectual superiority of the white race. Next minute, someone brings up the aforementioned quote and it's Pfft, Herodotus? That olive munching Dago did no squat. Probably never even left Greece. All that was until very recently. See, in the last 30 or so years, the so-called debunkers hatched a plan. It went something like this. First, we'll get us some bow ties, because everybody knows a bow tie means you're an expert. Next, we'll make sure to add a few extra letters after our names. And then, finally, duly titled Professor of This and Doctor of That, we'll tell everyone that this word melancroes actually meant dark-skinned and not black. This plan was bold, it was audacious, it was irreverent, burying hundreds of years of hallowed classical scholarship. And boy, was it desperate. But most importantly, it was successful. Today, a lot of pseudo-debunkers have piggybacked off this alternative translation, proudly proclaiming See, the ancient Egyptians were dark-skinned, not black. And just like that, with a lick of ink and a nice acrobatic twist of the medulla oblongata, the blackness of ancient Egypt was banished. Or so they thought. Sadly for these duplicitous types, we live in the information age, and almost everyone can read now. Surprise, surprise, even us black folks. And this black folk, yours faithfully, started his reading here with Comte Devoni's book Travels Through Syria and Egypt, which is where you can find the Herodotus quote cited earlier. Unlike many modern day translators, Volney the classical languages expert, Volney the renowned jurist and philosopher, Volney the very first Egyptologist proper, was an honest man. He translated the term melancholies in its proper context and in the most natural way possible, that being as meaning black. In my own copy of the Histories by Herodotus, translated by the Oxford classicist Aubrey de Selincourt, the rendering is, quote, black skins. Then there's this translation by Victorian classicist and historian George Rawlinson in which he uses the expression black skinned and on and on it goes. Now is it really likely that modern day translators have come across some revolutionary method of decoding ancient Greek or is something else likely going on? I mean we all know how the Greeks, many of whom look like this, are so often taken aback by people who look like this that they often can't help remarking on how dark-skinned such people are. Meanwhile, on planet Earth, 
when a white person visiting the continent of Africa describes the people he sees as being black and having woolly hair, nobody in the room, not a single person, is thinking of this. Instead, they think of this. And then there are the inconsistencies caused by this dishonest new translation. When the revisionists come across the word melancroes in other contexts across ancient Greek texts, they translate it simply as black. But when they find parts where Herodotus and others use it in reference to the ancient Egyptians, then it's dark skinned again. And it's not even funny the amount of times the ancient Greeks describe the Egyptians in such terms. In fact, you will struggle to find one instance in which the ancient Greeks remark on the physiological differences between themselves and the ancient Egyptians and don't remark on how dark their skin was, or their kinky hair texture, lip size, flatness of nose, and other physiognomic quirks as seen from a European's eyes. Again, are a people who are typically among the darkest populations of Europeans taking their time to remark on skin tone that is in the most extreme cases only half a shade different to theirs? Or is it not more likely that the ancient Greeks were documenting fundamentally profound differences in phenotypical characteristics? I'll leave the answer to the cleverest and most streetwise listeners on YouTube. If you know, you know. Now at this point, there'll no doubt be some saying, Well, how do you explain the Colchians then? Herodotus says the Colchians had dark skin and woolly hair. We all know Colchis was undoubtedly European and always has been. But has it? To answer, let's first find out where this region known to the ancient world as Colchis is. Colchis, in classical antiquity, refer to a region located on the eastern coast of the Black Sea, centered in present-day western Georgia. On a modern map, you can find it right here, where the ethnic group known today as the Abkhazians are found. As such, the region in recent years has been a flashpoint for conflict because the people of Abkhazia reportedly wished to be an independent country free from Georgia. Unfortunately for them, however, this doesn't have the necessary international support or recognition, so officially, Abkhazians remain Georgians. Okay, some of you are now saying, This dude needs to stop. Hey, no way he's convincing us that one of the whitest places in Europe was once black. Dude, that area is the reason white people are called Caucasian. That's where you get the Caucasus mountain range. There have never been any record of black people living there. Stop it. And that's exactly what websites like this one, Matilda's anthropology blog claims, quote, so far there is zero biological evidence for any black population having lived in the Georgia area, end quote. Well, little miss know-it-all Matilda would be right if it weren't for these guys. Meet the Afro-Abkhazians of whom journalist Zenaida Richter in the 1930s said, quote, we're a small group of people of African descent in Abkhazia who used to live mainly in the settlement at Zubza at the mouth of the Kodori River and the surrounding villages on the eastern coast of the Black Sea. Close quote. So much for there being zero evidence, eh Matilda? Now the Wikipedia entry on Afro-Abkhazians claims their origin is still a quote, matter of dispute among experts. Well, yes it would be, wouldn't it? Like we pointed out in our video on the Gehers and Sabaean scripts, the experts are often acting all confused whenever the truth behind an obscure historical fact might otherwise cast a black past in some less restrictive light than, say, slavery and the 1960s. You see, the way in which these so-called experts have wondered about Afro-Abkhazians, you would think the world never knew about them until sometime last year. Except that records of these black people living in notionally the whitest region of Europe persist as far back as 1927, when Russian writer Maxim Gorky encountered their settlements and concluded their origin to be ancient. But even before then, there was that time Russian anthropologist V.P. Vrady in 1912 came across the Afro-Abkhazian nation and went on to write about their numerous settlements in 1913. But wait, 
What's this? Records from Arab travelers about blacks in the Black Sea region going back as far as the 17th century? Then you have this. Afro-Abkhazian writer, historian, and ethnographer Dimitri Gulia, who demonstrated in his book titled The History of Abkhazia that his people's heritage might well have stemmed from ancient Egypt. Gulia compiles a vast array of Abkhazian words, place names, family names, and deities matching those of the ancient Egyptians and Ethiopians. Gulia also explored folklore, showing how the oldest known Abkhazian folktales chronicle the emigration of black Africans into the Georgia region. Okay, pause right here. Now imagine your Gulia eager to tell people who never knew of your people's existence before the early to mid 20th century. You can't wait to tell a finally attentive world how you and your people have been living quietly for thousands of years in a part of the world many didn't even know existed till you told them. Eager to tell them about your ancient heritage and epic story, only to be met with the expert response. That expert response goes something like this. No, 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 rubbish. Let me tell you how your people ended up in Abkhazia. Yes, yes, Abkhazia. Now you see, your people are the remnants of shipwrecked slaves, or so far as we can establish, descendants of some group of slaves transferred over sometime in the 1800s. There, fix that for you. Egypt. Come now, boy. Unbelievable? Well, it's the accepted narrative that so-called woke modern academia has allowed to dominate the origin theory of black Abkhazians. We'll spend all of maybe 10 seconds on this. You counting? Go. What are black slaves from Africa doing in the middle of nowhere in Eastern Europe at a time when European slavery was based on indigenous Slavic peasantry where we get the actual word slave from. This is like importing ice to the Antarctic. 10 seconds, just a little over. I could have been quicker and just said, you know this thing called racism? This is a sickness! But the best response to the prejudice laden expert opinion is that the black Colchians story is much older than the 1800s. Where's that time machine at again? As so you get back inside it and keep going back in time, you bump into the Muslim Arab traveler and geographer Ishtakri, writing in the 10th century and reporting that a large contingent of the Khazari Empire's army, who were native to the same Abkhazia region, were brown or even black skinned, quote, as if they were a kind of Indians. But you can keep going further back than this. According to scholars and church fathers St. Jerome and Sophronius, Cocus was quote the second Ethiopia. In fact, Sophronius in his Life of St. Andrew writes that towards the mouth of the Asparos and on the banks of the Phasis, there were Ethiopians. For those who don't know, Sophronius was writing around 600 AD and St. Jerome wrote around 400 AD. 400 AD. But wait, we can go even further back. We're not really sure of the exact date this guy was writing, but ancient Greek poet Pindar, who lived sometime between 522 to 443 BC, wrote in something called the Fourth Pythian Ode that Jason and the Argonauts, quote, came to the Phasis and there they fought with black faced Colchians. That's a record from 500 BC, 500 BC. Now all of this is to say this, you have historical account after account documenting the fact that there have been a millennia old community of black people living in a region of Europe now known as Abkhazia. And yet, when YouTube channels like Geography Now do a video on the world's strangest ethnic diaspora, like they did on the Afro-Abkhazians, they conclude that, oh well, Herodotus said something about the Colchians being black and woolly-haired like the Egyptians, but nobody really knows. Just think about that. 
It would have to be the most monumental coincidence in the history of history for Herodotus some 500 years before Christ to say the Colchians are likely Egyptians because they too are black with woolly hair and then for nothing to be said about it again for thousands of years until someone discovered a random group of black people living in exactly the same place with no connection to what Herodotus was talking about. But this coincidence is even more amazing than that. We don't have only Herodotus' words to go on, we have other ancient scholars, travellers, geographers, one after the other intermittently noting this obscure settlement of black people who still happen to be there today and yet we Afrocentrics are just supposed to avert our eyes, not jump to any conclusions or join up any dots. Let the geniuses decide for us what our lying black eyes are seeing. Never mind them though, because Herodotus seals it up for us. How? He tells us of three nations linked by culture from the very earliest times, Colchis, Egypt and Ethiopia. He says the Colchians, the Egyptians and the Ethiopians are the only nations who he knows have practiced circumcision since people have been taking records. But before this, Herodotus implies that the Colchians are an oddity in a sea of whiter nations when he reports that, quote, the Egyptians said that they believed the Colchians to be descended from the army of Sesostris, end quote. By Sesostris, Herodotus was likely referring to Pharaoh Senusret III, who looked like this, and whose daddy looked like this. Anyway, Herodotus is saying this odd placement of blacks in southeastern Europe is there because an Egyptian pharaoh left a sizable part of his army behind after some military expeditions into southeastern Europe, and that, to anybody genuinely interested in what some have called the oldest negro community in Europe, would be a satisfactory explanation. Except we don't live in a world filled with people with genuine interest. We live in a world filled with dishonest detractors whose next claim is, well, there's no archaeological evidence of Herodotus' claim. Without having the years and the money to devote to this double standard objection, I came across this. Gold pendants dating from around 400 BC from the very region the ancient world knew as Colchis, now part of modern day Georgia. Exhibit A purports to show a female bust and two sphinxes. Sphinxes, y'all. That's a clear Egyptian archetype. If you care to look closer at Exhibit A, you will see the downy ringlet-based kinky hair texture of one of the females on the pendant. Okay, okay, I'm reaching, right? Then feast your eyes on Exhibit B. Behold, the brothers. Now, do I really have to point out the hair on these topless male horse riders? The coarse, kinky, afro nature of them? Or the prominence of their lips? In any other European context, you might think these were cast by white racists attempting a rendition of the infamous Gollywog doll. Now, when you say there is no archaeological evidence back in Herodotus or Pindar and their claims, of black-skinned Colchians, do we include jewellery from the same region depicting creatures from Egyptian religion and half-naked cavalrymen with black features? So Herodotus says the Colchians were Egyptians because they too wear black with kinky hair and that they too practice circumcision from the earliest records of history along with the Egyptians and the Ethiopians. We find numerous historic accounts of these black Colchians throughout the historic record and right up until the 20th century, there were still enough of these black Colchians that white Europeans were writing home about them. Conclusion, Abkhazia or Colchis, just like Egypt, was once a black majority nation or civilization. Easy peasy. The truth is obvious. That is, unless you are my last C word. See, I've always thought the word I'm about to share with you didn't make any sense as far as cutting insults go. What word am I talking about? It's this word, cracker. Okay, hang on everyone, just relax a minute, I'm going somewhere with this. See, I was told growing up that the word referred disparagingly to white folk because white folk cracked the whip on enslaved black people in antebellum America. 
But apart from the fact that most of the time it was other blacks forced to do the whip cracking on their fellow blacks, that origin story just never made sense to me. It's a bit like me looking at my bigger brother who has a twisted love for punching me right in the gut and then going, I know what I'll call him just to get back at him. This will really hurt his feelings. Here goes. Hey big bro, you're nothing but a, 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 a puncher. And big bro will very likely look back at me and say, what? The word only reminds me of my painful subjugation to him. It doesn't do anything for me as an insult. But recently, I stumbled upon a much better explanation for the word cracker. See, it turns out the word has nothing to do with such a dubious origin story. Instead, the historical derivative of the word cracker is crake or crack. And its meaning can be seen as far back as the Elizabethan era during 1558 to 1603, when the word cracker could be used to describe loud braggarts. An example of this can be seen in William Shakespeare's King John. Quote, what cracker is this saying that deafs our ears with this abundance of superfluous breath? Close quote. The Wikipedia entry goes on. The word was later documented describing, quote, a group of Celtic immigrants, Scotch-Irish people who came to America running from political circumstances in the old world, close quote. This usage is illustrated in a 1766 letter to the Earl of Dartmouth, which reads, quote, I should explain to your lordship what is meant by crackers, a name they have got from being great boasters. They are a lawless set of rascals on the frontiers of Virginia, Maryland, the Carolinas, and Georgia, who often change their places of abode. Close quote. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, if we take away the insulting intent behind this word for just one second, it seems to be the best fit for describing white Western academics for at least the last hundred years a people who having used their innovations with the gun to subjugate the whole globe then proceeded to retrospectively use the pen to change history so that all their achievements however dubiously proven were then emphasized and overemphasized while those of others were erased and at the very best made to seem doubtful so much so that what should be clear as day is now often mired in controversy if the word cracker really means those who deafen us with their abundance of superfluous breath, then look at those who debunk the Afrocentric claims to Egypt and then compare their emphatic outlandish claims to the cold hard historical facts. It soon becomes clear which group of people are the quote great boasters, a lawless set of rascals with lawless parameters for ascertaining the truth. Indeed, they are very much, quote, often out to deafen us. Please support our work by going to trillblack.myshopify.com and pick up our latest t-shirt knowing you're helping us write the lies of history and looking pretty fly doing it too. Or you can donate to us by buying us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash trillblack. As always, we're repping black right, no doubt.